You know, before our coffee break, we have a presentation that, uh, you know, talking about imaging uh, peritometastasis. And, and Evan Siegelman, Dr. Siegelman, uh, was presented at this forum before and just gives an outstanding talk. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, sometimes the, the game is won or lost in the radiology suite. And I've seen remarkable uh, advances with how we, we look at peritometastasis and what we can do to better image peritometastasis for detecting early disease and also response to disease. Um, you know, Dr. Sieg Dr. Siegelman is a world expert. Um, he is, uh, you know, really a Pennsylvania guy. He did his uh, undergraduate at Franklin Marshall, spent a little time at Johns Hopkins, and then did his training at, at Thomas Jefferson and went to the University of Pennsylvania and has never left the University of Pennsylvania. And I think this is very important for all of us to learn about and for the radiologists in the audience and, and the surgeons in the audience to pay close attention to Dr. Siegelman because uh, this is a great talk and, he, and this is about finding it before it becomes an issue. Dr. Thank Siegelman. you. So here we go. Uh, in the next 20 minutes, here are going to be the six topics I'll be talking about. Um, mucinous neoplasms of the appendix. I think it's important to talk about appendicitis because a lot of patients, when they initially present, you know, they don't come to the emergency room or their doctor with this orange band, right, saying, I have a mucinous appendix of the, uh, uh, the appendix. Sometimes it's signs and symptoms of appendicitis. So I figured I would review some of the imaging findings of that. We'll talk about uh, pseudomyxoma peritonei. We review the peritoneal cancer index. I want to talk about ov mucinous ovarian neoplasms and tell you about the relationship of mucinous ovarian neoplasms with mucinous appendiceal neoplasms. And then to quote Shakespeare, Othello, Act 3, Scene 3, show me the ocular proof. I'll show you some case examples. So uh, um, this was the most recent classification um, I want to quote for you. There was, um, took place in 2016 that we made up uh, surgical pathologists and oncologists and medical oncologists and just give you another perspective about how we divide these neoplasms up. So the primary appendiceal neoplasms, we have the low grade, and I guess that would include the old term, the mucosal. They created a new category called the high grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm with the four letter acronym. And then the invasive ones which include mucinous adenocarcinoma when the pathologist is under the microscope and shows less than 50% signet cells, and then sort of a worse prognosis when you actually have uh, definitive signet cell adenocarcinoma where there's greater than 50% of signet cells. And then I'll show you a slide later in the lecture how appendiceal mucinous neoplasms differ from the routine colon adenocarcinomas, and occasionally we get the non-mucinous ones in the appendix. This is more for the lay people in the audience and even for some of the physicians who didn't realize where the term signet cell came from. Literally, a pathologist looked under the microscope and they took a signet ring and they turned it so you're looking at it in profile. And the signet represented the nucleus that got pushed to the side, mostly in a normal cell, the nucleus is in the center and it's being pushed to the side, why? Because this is a large volume of intracellular mucin, which is displacing the nucleus. And this is how a pathologist makes a diagnosis of a signet cell mucinous adenocarcinoma. So let me talk to you about appendicitis. So, you know, there are 300,000 appendectomies in this country every year. And fortunately, you know, when those studies get done, comfortably less than 1% will actually present with an occult mucinous neoplasm. I think it's part of my job as a radiologist to help educate, you know, the radiologists who are reading these scans, often CTs, often in the emergency room, and how to differentiate, you know, between inflammatory appendicitis versus a potential mucinous neoplasm. Turning it around, if the patient actually has a primary appendiceal mucinous tumor, you know, up to 50% will present with signs and symptoms and overlap with that of appendicitis. And it's my job as a radiologist to avoid what I call a peak and shriek where a local community radiologist opened up to the patient thinking they're going to be doing a routine laparoscopic appendectomy and said, why didn't Dr. Siegman tell me that this is not a routine appendicitis and, you know, they can find mucinous implants and so forth. So it behooves us to educate radiologists at the front line. Dr. Esquivel's final slide at the very top said appendectomy. Well, radiologists need to learn before a patient goes under the knife whether that's going to be for a routine appendicitis or something more nefarious in terms of a mucinous neoplasm. 
but if I was lecturing radiologists, here are some of the imaging findings of what we look for in routine non-neoplastic appendicitis. The appendix is dilated because it's functionally obstructed and it's not filled with mucin uh, or mucinous tumor, it's filled with pus. You can see wall thickening and enhancement. You can get surrounding inflammation. Sometimes you can get a literal stone called a lith, an appendicolith within the appendix. And just like with diverticulitis, if the colon perforates, sometimes the appendix, because of inflammation, can perforate. And we can look for surrounding um, imaging features to suggest perforation. So here's my first uh, set of images. This is a CT scan. And this is from a patient I uh, imaged, I think, about two weeks ago. And that arrow is pointing to an appendicolith. And um, this patient has a dilated appendix. And the second arrow up here is showing you the perforation, that there's gas actually located outside the lumen. So I like medical trivia. Um, Dr. Allison will be lecturing here. He's a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, somebody won a Nobel Prize for helping develop the CT scan. Anybody want to give me a name, please? We name a unit after him, blank unit. Townsfield. You notice how few of you answer. 90% of you in this audience know the four people most responsible for the development of the CAT scan. 90% of you know. Cool. First CT manufacturer was EMI. Anybody know what EMI stands for? Electronic Music Incorporated, which is a subsidiary of Apple Records, not the Apple Computer Company. It was the Beatles. John, Paul, George, and Ringo made a tremendous amount of money for Apple Records. Their subsidiary, EMI, had this clever scientist with time on his hands. They gave him money, said, do your research, and he developed a CT scan. So we like to avoid radiation in pregnant women and developing embryos and fetuses. So um, oftentimes we do MRI for determining if a patient actually has primary appendicitis in a pregnant woman. Here is a developing embryo slash fetus, and the arrow is pointing to the dilated appendix. And here, what we have is in coronal and axial views, we have dilated appendices with surrounding edema, and this was acute appendicitis in a pregnant woman. And just wanted to show you that the left colon has no surrounding edema. The dilated appendix does have surrounding edema indicating inflammation. And I will skip the movie. So, real basic slide. When I'm teaching radiologists, how do I distinguish between routine appendicitis, incredibly common, 300,000 appendectomies done a year, versus something that might represent a mucinous neoplasm? Here are some of the Scooby clues we use. Number one. Um, it's not only eight millimeters thick, but often the lumen is distended by greater than 15 millimeters. Number two, maybe we'll hear this from the pathologist, oftentimes you see calcification within the wall, and sometimes these mucinous neoplasms can show calcification. Number three, we have thickening of the soft tissues that could be eccentric, and that actually represents the, the actual mucinous producing adenocarcinoma cells. And number four, you know, if it's spread outside of the appendix, we're looking for complex ascites i.e. pseudomyxoma peritonei, i.e. jelly belly. So here's an example from the literature where we don't want to call this uh, routine appendicitis. Number one, the lumen of the appendix is dilated greater than 15 millimeters. Number two, I see eccentric calcification within the wall. And number three, I see some non-calcified eccentric soft tissue thickening. So I don't want a routine surgeon going in thinking this is going to be a routine appendectomy. And then we have to look beyond the appendix, looking for that thing like called the PCI index and finding out whether there might be mucinous societies or mucinous tumor in other places in this woman's body. So on to mucinous adenocarcinoma, the appendix, you know, we can see it's uncommon. And you know, we know this is a rare disease, but where I work, we say rare diseases are common and because we occasionally will see them. And you can see it's comfortably less than 0, 0.1 percent of these appendectomies, but it behooves us to know which of those patients might have that rare complication. Classically seen in middle-aged folks, and yes, for many of the patients, the signs and symptoms when they initially present are similar to appendicitis. And uh, right, much less common where you can actually feel a palpable mass or actually have specific signs or symptoms that might be specific for mucinous societies. And uh, all right, so on to PMP. And PMP, pseudomyxoma peritonei, is when you have mucin within the peritoneal cavity. 
And yes, the appendix is the number one cause, but just realize that we have other causes of mucinous neoplasms that are less common that, it, that can occur. For example, in the eurachis, this is for the physicians. Mucinous adenocarcinoma is the number one etiology of malignant uh, complications of the eurachis. And sometimes you can have a primary mucinous ovarian tumor that then spreads to the peritoneal cavity. So um, there are some epidemiology slides. And yes, uh, Dr. Esquivel and I have the exact same slide. I just gave you uh, the name of the textbook where Rokitansky first described this. We're getting a lecture from the, a pathologist after the coffee break. Rokitansky had many other things named after him in the gallbladder. The Rokitansky aft cross sinuses are part of gallbladder adenomyomatosis. And in the mature cystic teratoma of the ovary, it's called the Rokitansky plug, which is the non fatty uh, solid portion. So he was a giant. And interestingly, the first reported case by Worth. Dr. Esquivel showed was not even from the appendix, it's from the ovary, and I'm going to talk about it in more, that in more detail in about five minutes. And yes, Frankel did describe the first appendiceal um, mucinous tumor that resulted in mucinous ascites. Going back to that 2016 classification, uh, this is how I break it up. Acellular mucin, which in theory means the only thing out in the peritoneal cavity, that jelly belly, has no neoplastic cells. And in theory, just doing a washout and washing out all the extracellular mucin will be curative. Low-grade mucinous peritonei, grade one. I like to think in theory uh, that limited laparoscopic uh, hypake will be curative because this is low-grade tumor. And you can see uh, very optimistic five and 10-year survivals. And then unfortunately, you know, the, the not-so-great actors, the grade two and the grade three. When you either have mucinous adenocarcinoma or a high grade with high percentage of signet cells. We've seen this slide already, and sometimes surgeons will ask me, uh, Dr. Sigmund, will you please tell me the peritoneal index? You can do the math. There are 13 areas we're obligated to look for, and the numbers go between zero and three, between all 13 stations, so the peritoneal index should vary between zero and 39. I just learned from Dr. Esquivel today that I'm going to be looking for greater than or less than 10 because that might divide patients up into who's, those who can get laparoscopic high peg versus those who will need an open procedure. Now in the word, what I used to think about is things that are greater than 20 being high volume tumor versus less than 20. And I have a slide to show you about potential limitations of CT when trying to make this assessment. So this is considered low score. They can get laparoscopic. Uh, a high peak and then high score considered uh, worse prognosis. And this is a study that showed some of the limitations of CT. Now, I don't want to uh, poo poo CT. I realize it's one of the initial studies being done when patients present with signs or symptoms of appendicitis. But if there is mucinous ascites, sometimes in the title slide, six of 52 patients will be understaged. And in this series where eight patients intraoperatively had a PCI index of greater than 20, CT prospectively only identified two of those eight patients. So when you go to a barber, you get a haircut. I happen to live in an MR barber shop. I do primarily MRI, so I'm going to give a shout out for MRI, which has no ionizing radiation. And just to quote uh, this work by Russell Lowe, who's from San Diego, showing that when you compared MRI and CT for peritoneal implants, that MRI does a better job. And if I was a patient or advocating for a patient and you were getting a follow-up, because um, once again, I realize that patients don't present with their signs and symptoms of appendicitis saying, you know, you know, please stage me appropriately. But once you have the diagnosis, I think MR is very reasonable for follow-up. And here's just an example from Russell Lowe's work where the CT examination is to the left, and CT does a good job for showing ascites or even complex ascites. And that arrow is pointing to some of the mucin that happens to be sitting next to the liver. And here are two different MR techniques. The middle image shows you diffusion-weighted image, uh, where the diffusion-weighted imaging is highlighting the actual the peritoneal implants. And then the thin rim enhancement on the far right-hand image is distinguishing between the mucin-producing adeno adenocarcinoma cells, which are enhancing, versus the non-enhancing extracellular mucin. So I want to, third to last topic, I want to talk to you about mucinous ovarian neoplasms. And I want to explain why this is important on the next slide. This is one of the subtypes of ovarian neoplasms. This is an example of a primary benign mucinous ovarian neoplasm. 
They tend to be large, and this is the one type of ovarian neoplasm where size does not correlate with malignancy. It's multiloculated, but there are no solid components, and this patient had no ascites, no implants. One of three things might happen when I have a woman who has both an appendiceal neoplasm and an ovarian mucinous neoplasm. Here are the possibilities. Was it the appendix spread to the ovary, the ovary spread to the appendix, or separate primaries? I want to tell you that the most common scenario is the first. So it's actually a mucinous neoplasm of the appendix, which is spread down into the peritoneal cavity onto one or both ovaries. So it's my responsibility as a radiologist. Every time I see a mucinous neoplasm of the ovary, I feel obligated to look at the appendix. I will tell you this, I work with my GUN oncologist. We're in the operating room and they get a frozen section. The pathologist, this is from an ovary, the pathologist will call into the operating room and says, Mrs. Jones has a mucinous ovarian neoplasm. Please make sure to evaluate the appendix to make sure we're not missing an appendiceal neoplasm. So I think this is very important to note. And when I lecture to radiologists, I make sure we evaluate the appendix. So I think this is an important article. 129 women had mucinous ovarian tumors. And look at the results. 97 had their appendix removed. And of the 10 that had both tumors in location, nine, the primary was in the appendix. But look at their conclusion. The appendix is normal at surgery. Um, no mucinous appendix was missed. So I think there are two areas where we have a chance to help these patients. Number one, it's the job of the radiologist reviewing the imaging studies prior to removal of these ovarian neoplasms to make sure the appendix is okay. And then I think our UN oncologists are very well educated to know, thou shall look for the appendix to make sure it doesn't get missed. All right, last topic, we'll just be showing you the ocular proof to quote Othello. Here we go. This was a recent case, and look, uh, uh, sometimes I'm not sure. I read this case. So this is a woman, 63-year-old. She had right lower quadrant pain, and I'm showing you MRI examinations in the axial, sagittal, and coronal image. And there is a tubular structure filled with high signal intensity, and I did not know whether this was a mucinous neoplasm of the right ovary or the appendix. I could not definitively say. And I told the surgeon who was operating, I said, look, I don't know. Be prepared to remove one or, I, or both structures. Here's the good news. No mucinous societies, no implants. And this is just a movie. And this movie shows that this turned out to be from the ovary. It was low grade. There was no ascites. There was no implants. And as far as I'm concerned, this woman was cured. All right. Next case. And I want you to play radiologist. This is a 46-year-old woman who presented with pelvic pain. And there's a trifecta here of three things that I train radiologists to look for all the time. Number one, there is a tubular structure sitting in the right lower quadrant that's greater than 15 millimeters. That's going to be a primary mucinous neoplasm of the appendix. Number two, looking at the arrows, there's a mass sitting in the region of the right ovary. That's going to be an implant from, unfortunately, the appendiceal tumor. And these things can be subtle. But all these little low-density nodules, unfortunately, these are the mucinous implants. So now it's my job to do the PCI index and let the surgeon know you know the extent of peritoneal disease to figure out how we can best modify and personalize their treatment. And we've heard a lot about this, and I won't go into detail since I'm just a radiologist, but you know, here are some of the uh, routine standard treatments we have today in 2019. When patients get treated, and they've had their cytoreductive surgery and their hypake, it's my job to try to figure out if there's any residual disease. And some of the challenges in terms of patients trying to figure out if I'm getting better and I'm getting worse, why is it as a radiologist using this disease, why is it a little bit more challenging? It's because what we're oftentimes measuring are the pools of mucin. And I really think that the true cancers are the mucinous producing adeno adenocarcinoma cells that are often just in the wall or sometimes in thin septa. So I think just measuring the volume of the mucin pool isn't not a really true surrogate of determining whether your patient is getting better or actually progressing. This is that same patient I just showed you the CT for seven years later. And while I think MRI is very good for detecting some of these mucinous implants, 
is because the mucin tends to be not very viscous. And when it's not very viscous, it's very well hydrated. And MRI is superb for showing us things that are non-solid or things that are well hydrated. And this woman has two regions of residual disease, seen very well on T2-weighted images. Uh, this is sitting in the, in the gastrohepatic ligament, and this is sitting underneath the anterior abdominal wall. And just showing you other techniques in the axial plane, we see the same two regions. So here's a 61-year-old man with abdominal fullness. Let's just play radiologist. There's a calcified mass sitting in the tubular structure in the right lower quadrant. This is unfortunately is going to be a mucinous neoplasm of the appendix. There is fluid that has two different flavors sitting between the right hemidiaphragm and the liver. The stuff that's low attenuation represents the exercise of a mucin. The stuff that's soft tissue attenuation unfortunately represents cancer. The B represents bowel, and this stuff sitting adjacent to the bowel unfortunately is mucinous implants. So this person's going to have a PCI index of greater than 20. And this patient would probably benefit from going to an experienced surgeon who knows HIPAG, and it's likely going to be not a laparoscopic procedure, but an open procedure. The good news is, I think, you know, mucinous appendiceal tumors very rarely give rise to hematogenous metastases. And uh, Dr. Katz showed examples of colon cancer metastases and ductal adenocarcinoma metastases that went hematogenous to the liver. The good news is it's very rare to actually see lesions going into the meat of the liver, into the center of the liver, that would have spread hematogenously. These are benign cysts. And I'm going to give a shout out to Dr. Sugarbaker, who will be our last lecturer. And this is a nice review slide he gave that showed the unique differences between these mucinous neoplasms of the appendix versus routine colon cancer. And uh, we want to get this number up with having a much higher than 60% uh, tenure survival with combined treatments. And I think that's one of the purposes of this meeting, to go onto the cutting edge and come up with personalized cutting edge treatments. So just to show you how we do this with MRI, you take a look and there is a large volume of complex ascites. And on the left is a T-tweeted image, on the right is the post-gadolinium image. And here's my idea about MRI path correlation. The stuff that doesn't enhance is going to be literally the extracellular mucin that gets removed um, at time of surgery. Everything you see that's enhancing on the right-hand slide, this thin rim of enhancement along the peritoneal cavity, and these enhancing septa within the fluid, those represent the cancer cells. And they're sort of hard to measure. Uh, it's easy to measure the volume of mucin, but I don't think that actually gives an accurate diagnosis of the actual malignant tumor burden the patient has. And here I'm just showing you uh, a combined slide showing you the large volume of mucinous peritoneal implants. And once again, just showing you an example what happens after patients get treated. Uh, I think it's very easy to see where the mucin is. We use T2-weighted images, and you can all play radiologist, and that's where that person's one region of mucin uh, is present in the anterior aspect of the left lower quadrant. And here it is on more T2-weighted images. And just wanted you to play radiologist because the mucin is hydrated and shows very high signal intensity on T2-weighted images. I think this is the penultimate patient. I can just show you all the areas where we see disease. Here are two regions. Uh, I'm showing you CSF and spleen. The arrows are showing you where the implants are along the liver. And then this is a coronal image, which is highlighting things that are non-solid. And here are the liver implants. Here are some of the implants then in the left lower quadrant. And this, you know, it's just very easy for us on MRI to see the mucinous implants. And this is a sagittal image. And this woman, unfortunately, has an implant sitting on her cul-de-sac. And actually, some of the mucin is actually going into the vagina. And we can explain why she was having a vaginal discharge. Unfortunately, the implant was invading the vaginal apex. So take-home messages. You know, if the radiologist listening to this or uh, on YouTube or however this gets distributed, you're not going to forget the appendix. It is our moral responsibility to find the appendix in every patient, to be comfortable in knowing its normal appearance and its appearance when you have routine appendicitis, and make sure we don't miss a potential mucinous appendiceal neoplasm. Number two, gynecologic oncologists or people who read uh, imaging studies on women with potential ovarian tumors. Anytime we think we have a mucinous ovarian tumor, it is our prerogative and our purview that we must look in the right lower quadrant to see 
There's actually a primary mucinous appendiceal neoplasm that was responsible for the secondary mucinous ovarian tumor. Find the appendix. Number three, anytime you see somebody with complex ascites, we have to assume that that might be pseudomyxoma peritonei, and the number one primary that's going to be is the appendix. This is embarrassing that in my own imaging journal, there was a review of pseudomyxoma peritonei in 1994. There was not a single image of the appendix. So it can be hard to see, and it's time to educate radiologists. You are obligated to, once again, could this be mucinous tumor and define the appendix. And with that, thanks for your attention, and we'll go on to our coffee break.